The K by Theodore Taylor, Chapter 15. At sunset, with the air heavy and hot, Timothy described the sky to me. He said it was flaming red and that there were thin veils of high clouds. It was still over our K, and we could hear nothing but the rustling of the lizards. Just before dark, Timothy said, "'Twon't be long now, Philippe. We felt a light breeze that began to ripple the smooth sea. Timothy said he saw an arc of very black clouds to the west. They looked as though they were beginning to join the higher clouds. I gathered Stu Clack close to me as we waited, feeling the warm breeze against my face. Now and then there were gusts of wind that rattled the palm fronds shaking the little hut. It was well after dark when the first drops of rain spattered the hut, and with them the wind turned cool. When it gusted, the rain hit the hut like handfuls of gravel. Then the wind began to blow steadily, and Timothy went out of the hut to look up at the sky. He shouted, De boiling over now, Philippe! "'Tis a hurricane, to be sure!' We heard the surf beginning to crash as the wind drove waves before it, and Timothy ducked back inside to stand in the opening of the hut. His big body stretched so that he could hang on to the overhead frame, keeping the hut erect as long as possible. I felt movement around my feet and legs. Things were slithering. I screamed to Timothy, who shouted back, "'Be nothing but a little lizard! Come in hot, high ground!' The rain was now slashing into the hut, and the wind was reaching a steady howl. The crash of the surf sounded closer. I wondered if it was already beginning to push up toward our hill. The rain was icy, and I was wet head to foot. I was shivering, but more from the thought of the sea rolling over us than from the sudden cold. In a moment, there was a splintering sound, and Timothy dropped down beside me, covering my body with his. Our hut had blown away. He shouted, "'Philippe, put your head down!' I rolled over on my stomach, my cheek against the wet sand. Stew cat burrowed between us. There was no sound now except the roar of the storm. Even the sound of the wind had been beaten down by the wildness of the sea. The rain was hitting my back like thousands of hard berries blown from air guns. Once something solid hit us and then rolled on. Sea grape, Timothy shouted. It was being torn up by the roots. We stayed flat on the ground for almost two hours, taking the storm's punishment, barely able to breathe in the driving rain. Then Timothy shouted hoarsely, To the palm! The sea was beginning to reach our hilltop, climbing the forty feet with raging whitecaps. Timothy dragged me towards the palm. I held Stewcat against my chest. Standing with his back to the storm, Timothy put my arms through the loops of the rope and then roped himself behind me to the tree. Soon I felt water around my ankles, then it washed to my knees. It would go back and then crash against us again. Timothy was taking the full blows of the storm, sheltering me with his body. When the water receded, it would tug at us, and Timothy's strength would fight against it. I could feel the steel in his arms as the water tried to suck us away. Even in front of him, crushed against the trunk of the palm, I could feel the rain, which was now jabbing into me like punches of a nail. It was not falling towards the earth, but being driven straight ahead by the wind. We must have been against the palm for almost an hour, when suddenly the wind died down and the rain became gentle. Timothy panted, "'Da I, we can relax a bit till the other side of the tempest hit us.' I remember that hurricanes, which are great circling storms, have a calm eye in the center. "'Are you all right?' I asked. He replied hoarsely, "'I'd be damp, but all right.' I heard him making small noises, as if it was painful to move. As we stood back from the palm trunk, we sat on the ground beside it, still being pelted with rain, to wait for the eye to pass. Water several inches deep swirled around us, but was not tugging at us. It was strange and eerie in the eye of the hurricane. I knew we were surrounded on all sides by violent winds, but the little Kay was calm and quiet. I reached for Timothy. He was cradling his head in his arms, making, still making those small noises like a hurt animal. In twenty or thirty minutes, the wind picked up sharply, and Timothy said that we must stand against the palm again. Almost within seconds, the full fury of the storm hit the Kay once more. Timothy pressed me tightly against the rough bark. It was even worse this time, but I do not remember everything that happened. We had been there a while when a wave that must have reached halfway up the palms crashed against us. The water went way over my head. I choked and struggled. Then another giant wave struck us. I lost consciousness then. Timothy did too, I think. When I came to, the wind had died down, coming at us only in gusts. The water was still washing around our ankles, but seemed to be going back to the sea now. Timothy was still behind me, but he felt cold and limp. He was sagging, his head down on my shoulder. "'Timothy, wake up,' I said. He did not answer. Using my shoulders, I tried to shake him, but the massive body did not move. 
I stood very still to see if he was breathing. I could feel his stomach moving as I reached over my shoulder to his mouth. The air was coming out. I knew that he was not dead. However, Stew Cat was gone. I worked for a few minutes to release my arms from the loops of the rope around the palm trunk, then slid out from under Timothy's body. He slumped lifelessly against the palm. I felt along the ropes that bound his forearms to the trunk until I found the knots. With his weight against them, it was hard to pull them loose, even though they were sailor's knots and had loops in them. The rope was soaked, which made it worse. I must have worked for a half an hour before I had him free from the trunk. He fell backwards onto the wet sand and lay there moaning. I knew there was very little I could do for him except sit by him in the light rain, holding his hand. In my world of darkness, I had learned that holding a hand could be like medicine. After a long while, he seemed to recover. His first words, painful and dragged out, were, Philippe, you all right? Be true? I'm okay, Timothy, I said. He said weakly, terrible tempest. He must have rolled over on his stomach in the sand because his left hand because his hand left mine abruptly. Then he went to sleep, I guess. I touched his back. It felt sticky, warm and sticky. I ran my hand lightly down it, suddenly realizing that I too was completely naked. The wind and sea had torn our tatters of clothes from us. Timothy had been cut to ribbons by the wind, which drove the ti- rain and tiny grains of sand before it. It had flayed his back and his legs until there were very few places that weren't cut. He was bleeding, but there was nothing I could do to stop it. I found his hard, horny hand again, wrapped mine around it, and lay down beside him. I went to sleep, too. Sometime long before, long after dawn, I awakened. The rain had stopped, and the wind had died down to its usual whisper. But I think the clouds were still covering the sky because I could not feel the sun. I said, Timothy? But he did not answer me. His hand was cold and stiff in mine. Old Timothy of Charlotte Amale was dead. I lay there beside him for a long time, very tired, thinking that he should have taken me with him wherever he had gone. I did not cry then. There are times when you are beyond tears. I went back to sleep. This time when I awakened, I heard a meow. Then I cried for a long time, holding Stew Cat tight. Aside from him, I was blind and alone on a forgotten cave.